Paul's house, and it seems like you talk to people, and everybody's excited to hear and find out you got Sunday night service, but uh, uh, I guess their lives, they forget to, to, to be here, but God can wake them up and help us to, to realize I'm glad for you that are here. I tell you what, I hope uh, people are getting uh, out of the uh, seminar of what is definitely getting out of it myself. It's being helped to me. And I appreciate the, the gentleman, Brother Donovan and Brother Michael Smith, both of them just doing a great job. Amen. We have any spoken requests tonight? Maybe? Sister uh, Cindy has been having a lot of physical problems and uh, Sister Angela is up in Branson but she's been very Break all this crud that's been going around. Um, just passing it, passing it, passing it, but God can dry it up. Amen. Amen. Pray for uh, PJ and Alexis and, and Marcus and, yes. and uh, Malik and all of them that God will just minister uh, uh, in our lives. Our family, our girls, our boys. I mean, all of us, we got needs. Amen. Amen. Pray for those that are sick. Sister Cindy, Brother Nick. Sister Smith, uh, pray that God will give favor and wisdom and give me the guidance that I need to be the shepherd that God would have me to be. Amen? Amen. Let's pray for this service. Why don't you stand? Sister Hannah's definitely been fighting the weather situation too, something. So let's pray for her tonight. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we just love you, Lord, and we thank you for all you've done.
what's needed, Lord. Thank you for all you do and have done, Lord. We praise you. We praise you for touching our bodies. Amen. Before we get started and go any further, if anybody needs uh, prayer for their body, amen, needs God to touch our bodies tonight. Amen, Sister Mary. Amen. Come on to the front. Amen, Sister Hannah. Amen. <coughs> I'm going to have to pray for me as well. <coughs> I'm actually feeling better, but I need God's touch. Amen. 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 All right, let's make our way to the front. Let's just uh, trust the Lord to make us better than what we were when we come in. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Seek with the Lord. Amen. 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 Be open to His wisdom and His spirit. Amen. Good to have each of you here. All right, you can be seated tonight. Good to have uh, the Lord here again. Good to have each of you here. Your heart should just let God do what He wants to do in us tonight for His glory. Amen. All right, we're going to let the ushers come and receive the offering tonight. Just give always and give it to the Lord. Good to have Sister Jane. She's yeah. right there. Good to have her in the house of the Lord, each of you. And I'm telling you, God is a God that doesn't disappoint you. Amen. 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 Amen.
Praise the Lord. Steak is delicious. I believe steak is delicious. Now, you're going to see how personal that is in a minute. And you, know, Sister Smith, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. Amen. Now, can either of those statements be true without faith? Yes. Which one could be true without faith? Steak. Really? You believe that steak is good. You don't have to have faith that it's going to be good. What if they didn't cook it the way you want it? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, you see, when we use the word believe, we have to think about the faith behind our belief. Mm. You see, um, Paul do it like this. In Romans chapter 10, Brother Andrew, I need you right now then. <laughs> I'm going to stick on you until I get you right. <laughs> chapter 10. Amen. Romans chapter 10. There. You can start with your favorite verse. The one that everybody will always say. You memorize this verse. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth uh -huh. the Lord Jesus. You, can you tell us what number that is? Nine. All right. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus. And shalt believe in thine heart that uh -huh. God hath raised him from the dead. Yes. Thou shalt be saved. That requires faith. Mm. Yeah. Continue. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Uh -huh. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Yes. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Go to verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. They have not all obeyed the gospel. Even 700 years before Isaiah said. Mm -hmm. Who hath believed our report? Isaiah wrote that 700 years before Christ was born. Who I believe our report. Believe our report. So, so, so people are, is having a belief problem. Yeah. Amen. They're hearing, mm. but we have a belief problem. Mm. 
Now, go to Isaiah 53 where this all started. And let me show you something that uh, is going to change your life forever. <laughs> Isaiah uh, 53. Amen. Now, let me see. Start. Verse 1. Yeah. Who hath believed our report? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Who hath believed our report. And whose heart? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Come on. So we need to dig deeper into that. Mm. Because it looks like we are not believing his report very well. Mm. We're, we're having some issues. Yeah. You see, in order for the gospel to go ahead, they got to be some belief. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. And we need to figure out where the belief problem break down. Come on, brother. God help us. If Paul is saying this, and Isaiah said it before, now watch this. Go down to be, I believe, verse. We're 53. Mm -hmm. Uh, start with this one. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Okay. Let us try to explain something. Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus Christ. Right. Yes. All right? Yes. Surely, meaning I am certain. Yes. Mm. Meaning I know. Right. There is no doubt. Right. That he hath borne our griefs. He hath borne our griefs. And well, carried our sorrows. And carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken. Uh-huh. Smitten of God. Yes. And afflicted. We know that this happened, right? Right. On the cross. Right. Now what the other verse says. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Now read it properly with all the grammar that you can read. But. But he was wounded. Wait now. 700 years before he was born. Ah. Uh. It was written. Was. And it says. But he it was. was. Yes. So when did this happen? Okay, don't answer that. Continue the foundation reading. of the earth. He was wounded for our transgressions. Yes. He was bruised for our iniquities. Yes. The, ta the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And. And with his stripes we what are. Happened? We are healed. Okay. Now let me explain to you. What happened there? Your Bible, this book, your book, is very personal. Yes. Mm. It's written right. for you. Amen. Amen. God, don't make mistake. Amen. He knew that you were going to read it. Mm. So that's why it was. Yes. Amen. 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 Now, we're going to talk about Revelation. And I'm telling you, what you're going to hear tonight is going to happen. Amen. What Isaiah talk about, we should be deep believing for them now. Amen. We should believe that we can pray for one another and they are healed. Amen. Amen. That's right. Glory. Glory to the Lord. Christ paid for it. That's yes. right. Redeem means paid, paid for. for. In full. There was a ransom. His That's blood right. was shed because of today. Amen. When you read this, you know it's talking to you about today. Amen. 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 That's right. Isaiah wrote this 700 and something years before Christ was born. And now he used the term was because you are reading it today. Amen. And it's for you today. Amen. Amen. Very, very personal. But you have to believe. Yes. 
Amen. Amen. So, if we go back to our two sentences, mm. I believe that steak is good. Woo! Amen. Amen. tried it, I know. You tried it and you know. Yeah. I've tasted and I know. Do you believe that God is good? Yes. Can I ask you why? I know. I tried it and I know. And I know. Amen. I tried it and I know. Amen. And I'm going to share it with someone else who haven't tried it and I know yet. Hallelujah. Amen. We need to believe. Yeah. That's very, right. very. I could not get away from it while I was preparing for this. Right. So I just need to share it with you. Amen. Amen. So without further ado, Brother Smith, can you start off? By the way, uh, Pastor, can you pray for us? Please? We just love you tonight. We thank you, God, for the ability that you put within these men to minister to us tonight. And God, take all of us. And set it aside. Yes. Lord, let us be the channel yes. for you to flow through. Touch and anoint these brothers and yes. use them. Yes. God, anoint our minds, all of us, to be open, God, for yes. you to just fill us up yes, with all you've got for us. That will make us better servants and, God, more effective for your glory. Yes. We thank and praise you, Lord, for what you're about to accomplish. Yes. In Jesus' yes. precious name. Yes. Amen. 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 Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Amen. Well, God bless you. Uh, shalom to each and every one. Uh, uh, praise God. Very happy to have you here tonight. Uh, I'm very blessed uh, to have the opportunity to, to share some of this information with you. Uh, I'd like to thank Pastor Charlie Jordan for the opportunity to teach tonight, along with uh, uh, Donovan Smith as well. Well, praise God. Now, for the record, uh, tonight is Sunday, June uh, 23rd, 23rd. 2024, right? And uh, now, for those that are watching on Facebook or perhaps YouTube, YouTube in, in another day or two, uh, my name is Michael Samuel Smith, and uh, it's really a great honor for me to be with you tonight. A uh, number of things that we're going to discuss tonight uh, is going to be new to you, a lot of things. And there'll be a few things that are opinion. Obviously, there's some of that in the book of Revelation. But I do believe that uh, the good news is, if you know the Lord is your Savior, and, and you have that uh, in your heart, you're not going to go through this. Right. Amen. But, uh, unfortunately, uh, our loved ones, those that we know, and people yeah. outside of the Lord, if they're left behind after the rapture, they're going to go through these things. Yeah. And, uh, so, anyway, uh, now, we went through the seals before. We did six seals in the past. And then there was a break. And now, the last seventh seal is in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. So we're going to be uh, in Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9 with me. The way this will work tonight... Uh, my part one, I'll be going primarily through chapter 8, and then followed by Donovan Smith, who will give chapter 10. And then after him, I will come back, part two, and I will give chapter 9, okay? Now, I do have to apologize about a few things, and that is uh, due to the, some of the technological li limitations, if you will. There will be a few times I have to turn my back and flip the chart. And, and put the microphone down, so uh, I do apologize about that, but it's just something that we have to work with, and, and we can handle that, right? Okay, so again, we're in Revelation chapter 8. If you follow along with me, I do teach the uh, King James Bible. Uh, we also have some handouts uh, that you were given. There's six pages to that handout that you could keep and take home. I would hold on to those. In fact, uh, in the future, we, we've given some of those out before. If you want to take some of the other handouts with you in the future, just, just bring them all with you when you come. That's fine. You might find something useful with that. Okay, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, and I will read it. And this is the seventh seal, and it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, 
there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, I've talked about this before, uh, so prophetically speaking, my personal opinion is when you read about an hour, such as the hour of temptation, you're all familiar with terms like that, the hour of temptation is the seven-year tribulation. Okay, it's seven years. Okay, so uh, so what is half uh, of, of an hour is half an hour, right? So half hour is like 30 minutes, right? right? You agree with me. That 30 minutes is the last three and a half years of the tri seven-year tribulation. That's what we're dealing with. That's what's inferred here, okay? Okay, so uh, now I want to show some things to you, some trumpets. I brought my trumpets with me. And uh, I've had these many years. Now, as you know, in the Jewish world, in a Jewish synagogue, there are certain feast days where they blow the trumpet in the synagogue. Now, you have what they call a music minister in the Christian church. You're well familiar with that. They have something called the cantor. He's the, he's the music minister in, in the Jewish synagogue. And he's the guy that usually blows the trumpet or the shofar, shofar means trumpet, if you will. This is a traditional trumpet, okay? And this is usually what they use. This is a real ram's horn from Israel. The other one that I have, which makes a much more booming noise, uh, this is a Yemenite shofar. It's actually uh, from the antelope. Now, it takes a lot of time and effort and sometimes years to learn how to practice to, to make a sound with this. So I'm not going to be able to make any noise for you. But uh, but anyway, you know what it's about because we are in trumpets tonight. Yeah. We're going to go through trumpets tonight. That's why I wanted to show that with you. Okay. Now the other thing is in, in the Western world where we are, when we deal with prophecy, uh, people that study prophecy, it's all about the prophecy and then the fulfillment of the prophecy. That's what they study, right? Well, in the Jewish world, that's not what they do. They're looking at types and shadows. That's what they do. They're looking at patterns. And that's what I want you to visualize tonight. You notice I take a lot of time uh, giving handouts and information and, and I show you things on a poster board because it's easier for you to visualize in your mind what we're talking about. If I didn't have any of these training aids, uh, a lot of you would have differences of, of a prophetic picture in your mind. So that's why we do those things, okay. So anyway, that was uh, Revelation chapter eight, verse one. Okay, so now uh, Revelation eight, verse two, and it says, and I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, my opinion is the seven angels that they're referring to um, that were given the seven trumpets were the seven angels over the seven churches. Remember chapter 2 and 3, we talked about the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. You remember that, right? And, and I'm alluding to Revelation chapter 1, verse 20 talks about that. I believe these are the same angels that's referred to here in this one verse. Okay, so now we're going to go down to Revelation chapter 8, and we are into verse 3, 4, and 5. You're going to find this fascinating. And it says, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Okay, so obviously this is this is another angel, right? right. Okay, so uh, what I would like to share with you is, uh, again, my personal opinion is, and I'll tell you why, 
we believe that this angel is Jesus Christ in his high priestly work. He talks about that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 and 16, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20, and Hebrews chapter 7, verse 28, and also all of chapter 13, verse 50, I should say chapter 13, verse 50. The censor is always mentioned in connection with the high priest. That is alluded to in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2, Hebrews chapter 9, uh, verse 4. That is why we believe this particular angel is Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I, I think that's kind of important. Okay, now what I would like you to do is that you go to page 1 of your handout that we gave you. It should say the seven trumpet judgments, and underneath that chapter is 8 to 11, the way that it's listed, right? Everybody got that? Amen. I'd like you to look at that picture. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read that, chapter 8, verse 7. So let's take a look at that. It says, The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burned up, and all the grass was burned up. Okay? Now, uh, let me say something about that. Again, that's the first trumpet, not to be confused with seal before. Based on what happened with the plagues in Egypt, 3,500 years ago, mm -hmm. we know this trumpet plague with hail, fire, and blood is literal in the future Amen. during the tribulation. This isn't just happening in the Middle East. It's going to happen worldwide. Amen. This means, pay attention, this means that one-third of all the trees and 100% of all the grass on planet Earth will be burned up. Did you get that? And we are now in HD. We're talking high definition, what this is, the ramifications of, of what this is talking about. Absolutely, yeah. Most of the air that we breathe is produced from water and trees. Yes, right. Water in the oceans. The Pacific Ocean alone covers over three-fourths of all the surface of the world. Oxygen is made up of 21% of the atmosphere. With one-third of the trees dead, breathing air is going to be difficult. There's a lot going on here with all the trees. With one-third, this is just one-third of the trees, but all of the grass on planet the Bible tells us in this judgment, all the grass will be burned up. That means that all the milk cows and cattle and grazing animals will die because they do not have the grass to eat for food. And the stench from their bodies will not go over well with the humans. The blood and, and hail will shred much of the plant life, just like Egypt, and the blood left behind on the land will attract flies and gnats, just like what happened in Egypt 3,500 years ago. It's important that the reader realizes the terrible consequences of this judgment. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at some parallels. <coughs> These are plagues that took place in Egypt 3,500 years ago when Moses and the evil Pharaoh and all that was going on. Notice warning number one, uh, the waters turned to blood. Mm -hmm. And I gave you the scriptures in the Old Testament where you can find that. By the way, if you have any questions tonight, uh, at the end uh, of my 
teaching, uh, you're welcome to come, come back here and ask questions. And if you want to take a picture of something that I have here with your cell phone at some point after service, uh, feel free to do that. Okay, now some of these there were warnings, such as Moses tells the Pharaoh, around this time tomorrow, he's giving them one day notice. Mm -hmm. But there are cases to where he doesn't give them a notice. He just lets them know it is going to happen. And uh, so, warning two, of course, was frogs on the land and in the homes. Here's no warning, lice on people. It just happened. Okay, in other words, there wasn't a warning. This is going to happen tomorrow or, or whatever. Warning three, flies in the home. Warning four, disease on the cattle, which is really horrific to that culture. Here's another no warning, oils and sores on man and on beast. Uh, then again, warning five, uh, they got a warning. Pharaoh was told, you know, unless you let the people go in a certain amount of time, this is what's going to happen. Thunder and hail and fire. You can be best assured that's going to happen in the future. Warning six, locust. Okay. Now, the locust in Egypt... Uh, they, it says in Proverbs uh, chapter 30, verse 27, they do not have a king. Did you know locusts do not have a king? However, the locusts in the future, they will have a king. Uh, Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 through 12, they will have a king, okay? And of course, that's a demonic king, if you will. Here's another no warning, darkness. <coughs> Ooh, how long was that? That was three days. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have uh, another warning, death of the firstborn. Most of these are going to happen in the tribulation. And remember, the seal started at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. And unfortunately, a lot of people are of the understanding that, well, things are not going to be very rough during the first three and a half years because the Antichrist... He's dealing with this, this peace agreement with the Jews and, uh, you know, uh, peace and safety and nothing to worry about. Yeah, nothing to worry about for them for a while. But then he turns on them in the middle of the tribulation. However, the plagues are going on in the rest of the world the first three and a half years. And I do want you to know, uh, you know, we went from the seals, now we're getting in the, the trumpet warnings. These trumpets could be used to gather the people. They could be used as a warning. They could be used to attack, could be used for different things. The warning in this is they're warnings from God. These trumpets are warnings to people on planet Earth. Okay? So I wanted I wanted you to sort of to sort of get that. Okay. Exodus versus Revelation. This is some but not all. There's going to be satanic frogs, Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. There will be a plague of locusts, Revelation 9, verse 2 through 11. These are a different kind of locusts. We'll get into that later. Boils and blames on the people, Revelation 16 and 2. Notice it's Revelation 16 a lot of this stuff. Hailstones from heaven. Of course, we just read about that, right? In chapter 8, verse 7. Also, there's going to be darkness. Uh, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2, Revelation 16, verse 10. Okay, so we're dealing with trumpet, uh, trumpet plagues in, in chapter, uh, but now later, uh, later uh, in the book of Revelation, we're going to go through the seven vials or bowls. That's even worse than this. I, I got a call this last week from a friend. And he says, uh, and looking at your chart that I just gave you on page one, uh, you notice it says one third of the trees, uh, mountain of fire, one third of the sea, warm wood, one third of the waters are bitter, darkness, one third, sun and stars, and all that, uh, the first four. You know, and, and the call that I got was, what's all the one third about? And I said, that is a prelude to the really terrible, terrible wrath of God that will happen when the vials or bowls are released in a later time in the tribulation. Amen. Which we'll, we'll get into that uh, in the next few weeks. 
but I did want you to know that. Okay. Okay, so um, the second trumpet, uh, chapter 8, verse 8 and 9. So let me read that. And it says, the second trumpet. And the second angel sounded, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Okay, so let me say something uh, about that. Now, that is an assembly when it says, as it were. It's not literal, it's as it were, like something, okay? If it didn't have, as it were, uh, it would be a metaphor. I'm being a little technical in, in terms here. But nevertheless, uh, a third part of the sea became blood. Uh, that, that's all over the world, by the way. A third, a third of the earth. It, this is not a regional thing like just in the Middle East. Okay, so, so let's go back, if you don't mind, for a moment. And uh, remember... Uh, in Egypt, when the Nile River turned to blood, remember all that? There were gnats. There's a lot of nasty stuff that came after that. That's going to happen again in the future. It doesn't say that. Okay, remember I told you when the grass burns up, the food for the grazing animals, it's gone. And by the way, when you look at the, the, the seals, and then you go into the trumpets, the seals don't go away. Those judgments are still here. It's just more and more and more. And it keeps going that way. Okay? And when you get into the, the bowls or, or the vials, it's even much more worse than that when we get into God's wrath. There's reasons behind all this. You know, the good news is in chapter 4, verse 1, you go in the rapture. Amen. There really is a reason why God does not want you here during the tribulation. Amen. Okay, does not want you here. It's going to be very, very difficult for children to even go to school because of all the horrible things, especially when the bowls come around that last three and a half years of the tribulation as well. Okay. All right, so uh, let's take a look at, if you will, uh, let's take a look at chart number three on your handout. There are many scholars who believe in this Trump judgment, and we are uh, in, let's see, uh, verse 10 and 11. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the mountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made better. better. Uh, I'm going to share this story with you. Uh, some of you have heard uh, there's some kind of an asteroid that's coming towards the world. Uh, it's called Apophis. And uh, I want to go back uh, about 14 years ago. I actually wrote a story about this to a number of my close friends on the Internet. This was uh, February of 2010. I don't think anything was ever written about this subject up to that time. And I said, I did a lot of research on this, and I knew, I knew this asteroid is heading towards planet Earth, and it will be here uh, on the 13th of April of 2029. And if you took, if, if somebody took a gun and fired a bullet at you in your head, and that bullet went between your ear and your head, that's pretty close, right? Uh, that's how NASA thought how close this asteroid is going to come in, come so close to the Earth that there was a possibility it might hit. I mean, it would do horrific damage on this planet. It'd be like a nuclear winter. I mean, if it was, a, you know, a dead hit. And by the way, uh, the research that I did back then that year, 
2010, uh, and I had to go do the research, and I found out that NASA came up with that name. I said NASA, National Aeronautical Space Administration. They came up with that name, Apophis, because it means uh, destruction or destroyer in the Egyptian language. It's strange. Hmm. Okay, now there's another man, Dr. Thomas Horn, who wrote a book about this asteroid just a couple of years ago. Uh, now, Brother Smith, do you really think that's going to happen? I have my doubts about it. I think it might come close. But by the way, back in 2010, I knew if, it's, if it missed us in the year 2029, it comes back seven years, it's a seven-year event. It comes back in the year 2036, and it's a dead hit on planet Earth. Now, that was from NASA in 2010. And, of course, there were differences of opinion over the years, but, like I said, this time more, who, who passed away about a year ago, by the way, fall of last year, uh, he was very adamant that he, he felt that, you know, this was going to hit the Earth. And he says, and he says, uh, this asteroid, he believes this, this is an asteroid, and he thinks that's what they're talking about in Chapter 8, this wormwood. Uh, this Apophis asteroid. Now, an asteroid doesn't give off light. It's a rock, right? But it can do a lot of damage if, it, if it's large and it hits the Earth and it has, it has an impact. I wanted to share that story with you. I don't want you to be fearful of that. Uh, no matter whatever happens, the Lord is going to take care of us. I, I, I do believe that. But if an asteroid like that did hit, hit the Earth, there is a possibility uh, that it could make the waters bitter and uh, is there a possibility that's what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? Now, this is just a Mike Smith opinion, and I, and I could be wrong. I'll tell you what I think it's my opinion. I'll, I'll say that. Uh, it would, I, have, I think it's very highly probable that something like that hit the earth. And, of course, that's what rained fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And maybe that's what made the Dead Sea dead. I mean, I've spent time over there. I've been on the sea, on the Dead Sea and so forth. And you know the uh, the navy over there in Israel. They told me there are places in the Dead Sea. It's so deep they don't know how deep it is. Okay, but we know it's dead. Whatever happened there back 4,000 years ago in Sodom and Gomorrah, it's definitely a, a Dead Sea now. No question about it. Maybe it wasn't. I know it wasn't dead when the Lord made the earth. Okay, I know it's fresh water. That's probably why there were towns and cities that were there because uh, it was a very fertile place. So uh, I did want to mention that. Okay, so, so now, uh, as we read, let's see, we did 10 and 11. Uh, now, the fourth trumpet judgment, uh, let me say something about that. But let's read it first, uh, 12 and 13. Fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone, not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Okay. So uh, you also see that on your the seven trumpet judgment with the white page there. I think it's page number three that you have. You can see there it says uh, darkness, one-third of the sun and the stars, right? Everybody got that. Uh, okay, so now I want to say something about that. In the fourth trumpet judgment, Revelation chapter 8, verse 12 and 13, this happened in Egypt in Exodus chapter 10, verse 21, 23. The darkness was so dark it could be felt. The Egyptians could not see the moon or the stars in the darkness. And also in Revelation chapter 8 verse 13 that we just read, uh, and I, I, I just mentioned it, I said, and beheld an angel, well actually I didn't read that yet, so let, let me read uh, Revelation 8 13. It says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet 
of the three angels which are yet to sound. Amen. Okay. Uh, strangely enough, does everybody see that that we just read? Yes. Notice it says, uh, and I beheld and heard an angel flying. You see that? Angel. I want to focus on the word angel. Strangely enough, the Greek word for angel here uh, in verse 13 is uh, aetos. That's uh, A-I-E-T-O-S, which is translated to the word eagle. This angel is not identified. And that's true. We don't, we don't know who this particular, we do believe it's one of the seven angels of the seven churches, but we don't know what his name is. None of the commentaries that I know will touch this with a 10-foot pole. And believe me, I've read many over the last 48 years. Uh, I've actually sought the Lord over this. It's only an opinion of mine, but in Ezekiel chapter 10, and I want to say something about that, this is about 40 years ago, Dr. Billy uh, uh, Graham. He said, chapter 10 of Ezekiel is the most strange and misunderstood chapter in the whole Bible. And the reason that he said that, if you go back to Ezekiel chapter 10, uh, and you read that, it's talking about the four beings Okay, the four beasts, that they're actually the four cherubims around the throne of God. Okay. And anyway, uh, certainly it's one of the strangest descriptions of, of the four cherubims around God's throne of heaven. And in chapter 10, that's Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 14, it says, And every one had four faith. In other words, these four angels, these four cherubim around the throne of God, had four faces. Now these beings are very strange to us. Now there's a reason why I'm sharing this. I, I know this is definitely out there, but and I'm not saying I have, have the right answer, but I'm, it's a thought. And the first was the face of a cherub, and the second was the face of a man, and the third was the face of a lion, and the fourth, the face of mm. an eagle. So is it conceivable that the fourth cherub with the face of an eagle is the angel in Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, flying through the midst of the heavens? Well, only God knows, right? Amen. And I, I wanted to share that with you. Okay. So uh, that's good. I hope I hope that you uh, you learned something new there. Now, I'm going to go to another page. Talk a little bit about Satan here. Uh, the study of Satan is found in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. You'll learn about the characteristics of this fallen angel. Hell is not the place Satan rules. Does that come as a surprise to some? So let's talk about it. He will be in prison there someday in hell, and then death and hell will be cast in the lake of fire forever. But that, that's at a later time. So the angel over the abuso, or bottomless pit, is not Satan. Satan is the prince and power of the air over the earth. He is not in hell yet. Okay, so we're talking about Satan and some things about it. I'm sharing some things with you I want you to know because I think that they are important. So when did Satan fall? Okay, uh, Satan was fallen already in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, right? Tempting Adam and Eve. Know the story well. Uh, so he already was fallen. However, what access does he have? So let's talk about then, and let's talk about now, and let's talk about the future as well. Uh, in Job chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, Satan had access 
I believe, I'm sharing my opinion, I believe that, again, he's, he, yes, he's fallen. He's a fallen angel. But he still had access to heaven to talk to God. God allowed that. You may disagree. There are people that disagree with that, and that's, and that's okay. But he does talk about it in Job, and I do believe that is heaven. And, of course, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That's what he's doing there in heaven. That's right. He's accusing Job, and by the way, he's also still, if you will, accusing us as well. And, and, and we know our high priest is Jesus Christ, right? Amen. Okay, so I, I wanted everybody to get that. And uh, also, uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, 8, and 9 has something to say. So if you go if you go there for just a moment, Revelation chapter 12, 7, 8, and 9, not too far in the future. Okay. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in the heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, so now let's put it in perspective. It, it, in chapter, this is at a later time than what we're talking about now, in chapter 8 or 9. So when he is cast out in this chapter 12, he no longer has access. In other words, he, he and, and the fallen angels with him, they're coming down to raise real wrath on the earth. They don't have access with God anymore. That's over with. He has a short fuse now, and that's why things are so evil going on with all these plagues and everything. But I, but I wanted to put all that into perspective. I think it's kind of important. Like I said, it could be some points of opinion there with some people. Uh, but I did want to show that to you. Now also, the star Wormwood, uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 9 and 10, the Greek word for uh, Wormwood is absintha. Uh, it is synonymous with sorrow, calamity, hemlock, and bitterness. And it says that in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 15, Lam Lamentations chapter 3, verse 15, Amos chapter 5, verse 7. The stars in Revelation can mean, number one, real stars that you see, or they can be angels. It's important that you know that, okay? Okay, so uh, at this point in time, I'm going to turn the service over to Brother Smith. And we'll see you a little bit later. Amen. Are we enjoying this? Yes. 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 All right. Are we learning something? Yes. Amen. Yes. All right. Deep. Deep. <laughs> okay. Now, by the time we get to chapter 8, uh, where we just stopped, uh, you will realize that chapter one started with uh, our good buddy John on the Isle of Patmos in his person. Mm -hmm. Then, by the get by we, the time we get to chapter four, in the spirit he was caught up mm -hmm. in the heavenly. And he was there all the way up to 8 and 9, seeing all these things. Then, by the time we get to chapter 10, looks like his position changed again. So we're going to examine that. All right. So Brother Andrew, you're going to read for you. First one? Yes. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. All right. Here is the thing. This is where it's 
very, very important for each individual person to get comfortable reading their Bible, praying, and listening to good teaching. Uh, because there's a lot of opinion when it comes to certain parts of the Bible, especially in Revelation, uh, because of the different um, interpretations that are out there. Uh, how they spiritualize it or, 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 or stuff like that. So here we are now seeing a mighty angel. Mm. Now a lot of commentators, if you read commentaries, they might say, well, Jesus was never classified as an angel. So when you look at this and you say, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with cloud. Mm. Now, if you remember when we were doing Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> Daniel had the dream, the vision of the ancient of days clothed with the cloud. Right, that's point number one. Do you remember in Genesis chapter number 48 when Jacob was about to, to bless uh, Joseph's children? Go over there for a little bit. Let me show you something. And this is where it's very, it, it gets very interesting. How, how the word of God uses things. I mean, um, we know about the God of Jacob, mm. right? The God of Isaac, mm. God of Abraham, right? But Jacob <coughs> was when Jacob was bad. Mm. It wasn't when he was the great Jacob. Jacob was a deceiver. deceiver. He was a very bad guy. Now, about verse 4 of 48. Mm -hmm. And said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply. Let me, let, me, let me follow you. Because well, the part I, don't, I want to get to you, it says, when Jacob get up, it says, Israel get up. And Jacob straightened himself. Genesis 48. Genesis 48. Mm -hmm. See verse 4? Mm -hmm. It doesn't say uh, Israel. It's in 2. It's in 2. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And so, so, so. Read it again. And one and one told Jacob, and uh -huh. said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. Yes. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. So we're talking about the same person. Mm -hmm. right, right. But in reference to what is about to happen, the Bible called him Israel. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yes. Go to verse 15. We'll come back to there and settle stuff. This is the blessing of Jacob's son. Me? Yes. And he blessed Joseph uh -huh. and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk. No, go slowly. The God which fed me uh -huh. all my life long uh -huh. unto this day. Yes. The angel which redeemed me from all evil. The way, wait a minute. Does angel have power to redeem? Mm. Only Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, so when they say that, well, you know that the Bible never said angel referred to Jesus. We need to mm. dig into stuff ourselves. Mm. Because that mighty angel is referring 
to Christ. And I'm going to go further. Remember when we talk about the clothing of the, 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 uh, the cloud. Yeah. Now let's talk about the rainbow. In Genesis chapter 9, when the token of the rainbow is a promise. Mm -hmm. It's a promise that he will, will not, he will not destroy the earth by, by water. Amen. By complete destruction. Yeah. Complete and utterly destruction. And we see this mighty angel having that rainbow. And his face were like sun. Now verse 2. Back to Revelation chapter 10. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Now, in my opinion, this chapter 10, which is what we like to call <laughs> parenthetical, it's between, in this case, the trumpets. Uh, it is... It is all about that little book. That's what this chapter 10 is all about. That little book that is found in this mighty angel's hand. This little book is open. Hmm. Now let's look at this description. So from John's point of view, this mighty angel, one foot is in the sea. Is that what you just read? Mm -hmm. And the other foot is on land. Um, yeah. Now, well, it's, can I? Yes, go ahead. It's specific. It's the right foot. Mm. Mm -hmm. On the sea. That's in the sea. And the left foot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I don't, know, I don't um, know what that's all about, but. So, for, for those who, who, who've been to the beach, <laughs> if you've ever gone to the beach, or even the river, I want you to imagine one foot in the water and the other foot just for one moment. Why are you thinking? Now thinking, think of this person or this thing, a mighty person. Mm. And now think about the foot. Since you started, honey, why don't you read it again? Now, could you go back and describe what the feet were like in pillars, verse 1? Pillars of fire. Pillars of fire. Okay. Now, we can all say, well, you know, this is symbolic, and this is this, and this is that. I'm going to show you something deeper. Just, just I, I, I'm going to come back and explain this. Just go slowly with me. Verse, go back to Brother Andrew, verse 3. And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Okay. Number three, about the mighty angel referring to Jesus Christ. Who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? Hmm. Mm. Jesus. Jesus is. Amen. Now, there are other scriptures that we can go to to, to uh, find that description, but probably you know them already, but in Amos and in Uzziah and in um, Joel, you can see those things when they refer to the Lord as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. So, when he opened his voice, Roar oh, like a lion. Mm. Yeah. And then, what happens? And when the seven thunders had yeah. uttered their voices, I was about to write. Wait, 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 wait. Before you get there, mm. tell me something about the number seven, Brother Andrew. It's, the, it's God's number. 
God's number, mm -hmm. meaning of number perfection, completion, completeness. Mm -hmm. This is the end. Seven. I will not go eight because that's government. I'm stopping. I will not stop at six mm. because that's man. Mm. I'm man. going to completion. Seven. Amen. Now, here is the problem that I'm going to give you. That other verse that he was about to write, to mm -hmm. read, says something real strange. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, when you think about the Bible being written, you want to think about, like Moses, he just have time when he's not leading Israel, and he sits down and writes. Nobody really think about, he was out in the mountain and he met God, and he writes the same time. Nobody think about that, but here's what John says. I was about to write. Uh -huh. Meaning every time these events happen, he is writing. Yeah. Very, very different from most of the other books. <coughs> he is writing and what he was told? And I heard the voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now, I'm going to take a line from... What is this all about? God knows. See, when we go and talk about the vials or the bowls, you're going to see why these were not written at that time. These were are sealed up. Remember, Daniel was told to seal stuff up and go away for a time. The time for whatever these thun these thunders yeah. was yeah. wasn't until the vows later on. Isn't that good? Mm. I think it is. Amen. Amen. I think it is. Amen. I think it is. <laughs> Continue. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that are that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things that are therein, that they that there should be time no longer. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you um, so I read a lot. I mean, a great deal. I don't like writing. I probably say, tell you the story already that um, one of my attempted college, the last time I did better, but I, I had to do four English class, English literature and all that. And I took maybe 12 to pass four. And Hazel was the one who write most of those things for me. I don't like writing. Now, for Father's Day, my daughters think it was a great idea <laughs> to buy me a book, which now I have to write my dissertation. Well, Write things about me for them to know. Because they want to know stuff that I'm not saying, but I'm in my head to write. <laughs> and so I am I'm, I'm struggling with that. I'm gonna do it. Now when the Bible, our <clears throat> Bible, 66 books, when it takes up space to repeat something twice, mm. it has to be important. Yes, right. Right. Yes. Why John have to tell us twice that this angel have one foot here mm. and the other foot there? 
What I want wasn't sufficient. I'll let you think about it until the end. Continue reading. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants and prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Wait, no, he said it the third time. Uh -huh. This is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Emphasizing. He, he wants everybody to understand that this is not a simple thing. Mm. Yes, for sure. But anybody here understand what mystery is? You see, we used to have mysteries a long time ago. We don't have so much mystery. Anymore. Anybody understand what mystery is? I'll give you an idea what mystery is. Long time ago, when I was conceived, many, many years ago, it used to be that whatever the, the conception was, was a mystery. Today, <laughs> The lady can go to, to uh, ultrasound and discover what gender. But until the baby born, it was a mystery. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible said the mystery of God, mm. woo! I feel good. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that we don't know yet. Amen. It's in the conception stage in our lives. But it will be revealed, you see, at one point. What is happening here? The Jewish people, time will come to an end for them. <clears throat> Continue reading. You'll see what I'm saying. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. He said unto me, Take it. Wait, wait. Read verse 6. And swear by him that liveth forever mm -hmm. and ever, yes. who created heaven and the things that therein are, mm -hmm. and the earth yes. and the things that therein are, mm -hmm. and the sea and the things which are therein. That there should be time no longer. There should be time no longer. Mm. Okay. Before you get anxious. Before you get anxious, read verse 11. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples. So, so it's not literal time per se, right? Mm. Because in the same verse... That he's saying, time no longer. He said, you're going to prophesy later on. Mm. Are we getting it a little bit? Yes. Yeah. All right. Now, a lot of us don't believe in dispensation. Depends on your teaching. Dispensation is a period of time in which God deals with people. Like, uh, in the beginning, was innocence. And, and this dispensation is just like a child, right? Yes. Child is born. We heard it Look over the pulpit this morning. Innocent. Mm -hmm. Don't have a care. Don't malice. Don't just cry for hunger. Mm -hmm. Then you go into conscience. Start developing conscience mm -hmm. and guilt and all these kinds. Knowledge. It goes into human government. All these different times is how God, and if you look how God deal with his people during these different times. The Bible said when Jesus came, the time changed again. Mm. Out of law into grace. 
You don't believe it. You, you said that so quietly. <laughs> no, it's going to change again. Because the king is going to come to rule his kingdom. Amen. Amen. So that is going to be a time of time. That time change. Amen. This one is referring to the Jewish people more than everybody else. But uh, the, the mighty angel, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Amen. Yes. he steps out because he's going to put on some woes. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. I can't wait to hear those woes. Hallelujah. Amen. So back up to verse 8 or 9. Which one were you? 9. 9. Mm hmm and I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. All right. I'm going to give you all an opportunity to say what you think this is referring to. Yes. This Bible is the word of God. He said to you when you need it, it's, it's blessing us. That is good. He has many things we can know so that easily. But when you will talk about what you read, it will be like only. Oh, no, Very close. And, and then what happened? When you start living the life, the bitterness comes out. Mm. All of a sudden, your friend don't like you anymore because you can't go to party with them. Right. Hallelujah! Yes. Yes. They, they look at you different. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. That was good. See? That was good. I'm impressed. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord! Yes. It is the gospel. It is the word of God. It's your Christian life that is sweet when you take it on. Yes, mm. But when you have to live it and your your children who you want to see you live that life is bitter because you see them suffer. Mm. But we just have to stay tuned because if we take on this sweetness we won't see those judgment. Amen. Right. Amen. And if we know the bitterness, we will help somebody else come on this side. Amen. 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 Just a couple golden nuggets very quickly to share with you um, that deals with titles for Jesus. Uh, just a thought. But in chapter 5 of Revelation, something happens that's unusual. Prior to chapter 5, the titles of Christ are, are from the past. In other words, the Son of God and titles like that that you're well familiar with. Starting in chapter 5 to the rest of the book of Revelation, all the way to chapter 22 to the end, his titles are all Jewish titles. Okay? The Rod of Jesse, uh, the tribe of the Lion of Judah, the Lamb, those are terms that you will see through the rest of the book of Revelation. Okay? I wanted you to know that. Now, here's another golden nugget uh, for you. Obviously, John is, his body's on earth. He's been taken into a vision. Come up here, chapter 4, verse 1, like, if you will, mentally, spiritually, like a rapture. He's, in heaven. he's being shown the, the tribulation. And he's being told to write these things down and take it back to the seven churches, you know, which he did. 
Okay, so what's going on with that? Uh, here's a golden nugget. While he's in heaven, the 24 elders are the ones who tell him what's going on in heaven. It's the angels that are telling him what's going on in the earth down below. Okay. I don't think there's any exceptions to that rule, but I wanted you to know that. Okay. Okay, so now we are in chapter 9. Um, so, chapter 9, I'm in uh, Revelation chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. All right. And it says, this is the fifth trumpet now, right? And it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw, I saw a star fall from heaven into the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Okay, so, now I read those two verses to you. Again, a star that fell from heaven to him, notice it says him, uh, it was given in verse 1. And then it says he, meaning he, he opened, right, verse 2. Well, who could this be? Well, uh, if you will, go to Isaiah in just a moment. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Isaiah what? Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. I'm going to go ahead and read it uh, for the sake of time. This is what it says. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Okay, that word Lucifer uh, in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew, it means the light bearer. He's the light. He's the false light, not the true light. Amen. Uh -huh. But you notice he is fallen. Okay, so is this talking about a future time? I think I think it is talking. About, I think it's talking about this right here, the future here, a star that fell from heaven. So who is this? Who could this possibly be? Right. Also, if you will go, if you don't mind, go to Luke, the book of Luke, and I am in Luke chapter twenty-one, verse twenty-five. And I'll go ahead and read it. Luke 21 to 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now, uh, I'm not going to read it, but also 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 has something to say. Now, why am I saying all that? Because I believe it's identifying who this is. This, who is this star? Remember I told you earlier, stars could mean a star, or it could mean an angel. Mm -hmm. It could be a fallen angel. In this case, it is. Okay, so let's look at that again. I saw a star fall, uh, fall from heaven. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Who is this guy? It's Satan. Remember I told you? He doesn't have access to hell. He doesn't control hell. He's not in hell. Remember I told you that. But there's going to be a time right here in the future, in the tribulation. This could be the beginning of the last three and a half years. Uh, this is where... He loses uh, authority in heaven. In other words, he, he, he is cast down now. Okay? He's on a short fuse. That's why all these evil things are happening with this. There's a certain element here of the wrath of Satan. When we get to the bowls in the future, the real, real bad stuff, that's the wrath of God. Okay, so Satan has control over a lot of evil things. But I do believe, there are some that don't believe this, but uh, I could give you a long list of Bible scholars who would also agree uh, this verse, verse 1 and 2, is talking about Satan. Okay, so, so he opens the bottomless pit in verse 2, 
And there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of it. Now, I do believe this is happening in that last three and a half years of the terrible tribulation. So what's happening on earth is the, set, the Antichrist has already turned on Israel after the middle, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the two witnesses die in the middle of the tribulation, and their bodies are put in, dead in the street. They're there three and a half days, and they're raptured into heaven. In other words, they're resurrected from the yeah. dead. Mm -hmm. Okay, now my personal opinion is, uh, I think, this is my opinion, I think there's a connection between the two witnesses that are there identifying who the 144,000 are. So while we're there, uh, I want to say something. I'm trying to get you to think is what I'm trying to do here. Would you agree with me, now these 144,000 who are going to be in the, in the tribulation, and their mission is in the middle of the tribulation, is my old dear friend, and he was a very dear friend of mine, Saul Levitt, by the way, he used to say when the chips are really down on planet Earth that last three and a half years of the tribulation. It's the Jewish 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe. Yes. They're the kosher Billy Grahams that are going to be out witnessing to the world. Okay. Satan can't touch them. Satan, the Antichrist can't touch them either. Okay, But they die in the middle of the tribulation. Okay, so anyway, you know, I, I wanted to point all that out because I think it's important that, that, that we see chronologically where things are happening there. Uh, also, I mentioned uh, Satan uh, fell, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, we read that. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Revelation chapter 8, verse 10. Uh, now, let me say this too. There are differences between fallen angels and demons. I know I'm sharing some things here that are peculiar to what you've learned in the past. Uh, I do believe this is correct, by the way. And here are some of the differences between fallen angels and demons. Fallen angels can materialize themselves. And they can be used in combat. And if you think that's not true, Revelation chapter 9, uh, verse 1 through 12, alludes to that happening in the future. Now, demons, which are also evil, they are seeking embodiment in unsaved people and in animals. Now we see that, we see examples, that's why in that fifth chapter of Mark, where Jesus is there in Gadara, and Jesus asks this, this evil man about, well, what's your name? And, and he tells him, my name is Legion, for we are many. Uh, and, and I do believe it's, it's 6,000 demons in him. Because in a Roman legion, there is 6,000 troops. Now, many scholars will agree with that. There's some that don't, but I do believe. But, it, but it's sharing many things there in that story. But you notice those demons, uh, they ask permission to go into the swine. Right? So down below, I have, must have permission to enter a host or leave a host. And that's alluded to in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, Matthew chapter 8, verse 32. Okay, but I, but I wanted you to see that. Uh, that's an example. Well, why is it 6,000 demons? Well, I believe, I believe it's, uh, it's indicative of man is not in his right mind for 6,000 years from Adam and Eve to when the Lord returns with the church. And then man will be found in his right mind. Okay, in other words, when the Lord returns and only the righteous rule planet Earth. That's what I'm alluding to. So the 6,000 demons go into how many swine? By the way, that's in more than one gospel, but in Mark chapter 5, it's the only chapter in the Bible, in the New Testament, that tells you how many swine. It's 2,000. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what's all that about? Well, it's 4,000 years from Adam to Jesus, and Jesus is in the story in Mark chapter 5, right? Obviously, dealing with the, the man from Gadara, the demon-possessed man, right? That's 4,000 years. The 6,000 demons go into the 2,000 swine, which represents 2,000 more years, which re represents 6,000 years. That's where you are now. 
you're, at the, you're close to the end of the 6,000 years. The sixth day. Remember creation? Just think of each day. It really was literally a 24-hour day when God created, but he rested on the seventh day. And that is 6,000 years. Think of each year, if you will. Uh, each, each block is 1,000 years. There's six blocks. At the end of the sixth block, which you're there now, this generation, I believe, uh, then it comes the seventh day of rest, which is the thousand-year millennial kingdom. That's what's after the seven-year tribulation, which is the 70th week of Daniel. Okay. So uh, I wanted you to see that. Okay. Uh, fifth trumpet. We are Revelation 9, 1, verse 1 through 12. This is the most dreadful, frightening chapter in all of the Bible. Revelation chapter 9. I want everybody to get that. The theme of this chapter is hell on earth like never before. Remember, you're not here. That's good news for you. But it's not good news for the people left behind. Now, I want to say one more thing I want you to be thinking about. Remember those 144,000 that are ministering that the Antichrist can't touch them because they had the seal of God on them? Would you agree with me they were left behind with the rapture? Number one, would you agree with me they're adults in the tribulation? The answer is yes. Would you agree with me that they were left behind with the rapture? Did you ever think about that? I have. Uh, so, God had a purpose for them, and he's going to use them in a very mighty way. And that's why God puts a seal on them, okay, in that last, that last three and a half years of the tribulation. They're witnessing to the whole world, uh, like Billy Graham, if you will. They're a kosher Billy Graham, all, all 144,000 of them. But I want you to be thinking about things like that. That's important. Uh, so those are the only people that are protected. Okay, so uh, now I want to, let's take a look at uh, chapter 9. And it says, uh, now we already read uh, verse 1, 2, and 3, I believe. In verse 4, no, I correction, verse 3. I'm, I'm at verse 3 now, chapter 9. Verse there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth had power. Okay? Verse 4, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. In other words, uh, they're not to deal with the environment. Okay, now remember, the tribulation is going on for some years. And in some of these judgments before, when the trees were destroyed, maybe some of them are starting to come back to life. But whatever's what, what they, they can't touch that. Okay? So, the purpose here, they are to torment men, uh, but not the 144,000. Okay? Now, you notice I have here the first woe on men, verse 1 through 3. Uh, technically, the first, if you look at your chart that I gave you, uh, trumpet number 5 is the first woe, trumpet number 6 is the second woe, and the third woe is at a later time. There's parenthetical chapters in between, but, but I wanted you to know that's where the three... Whenever the Bible says woe, it means serious judgment, most serious judgment. Okay, so that's the first woe on them, uh, <coughs> verse 1 through 3. The command to the demons, or the demonic locust, is do not touch the 104,000, torment all other men, he's talking about men and women, mankind in general, for how long? Five months. Five months. I had somebody call me. I'll, I'll tell you who it was. Somebody who's on TV, on national TV every week. And a uh, prophecy guy, and he called me up a couple days ago, and he was telling me 
it's really funny because we were teaching Revelation 6 and 7 last week. He taught 6 and 7 last week on the air across the country. And then Friday night, which was two nights ago, he was teaching chapter 8 and chapter 9 on national television. But anyway, he called me a couple days ago, and he had a question about something on TV, and was there a problem with this or that on, on, on TV, on CTN TV, and, and we talked about that. And we were talking uh, a little bit about this chapter, and I told him, I said, uh, I shared something with him that really blew him away. He's a pretty smart guy. Uh, and, he, and I told him, I said, did you know this story of the five months men being tormented in the tribulation? Did you know there's a type and shadow of that in the Noah's Ark story? He said, say what? I said, yeah. I said, it's actually in the Noah's Ark story. There's a lot of stuff in the Noah's Ark story, a whole lot about prophecy. Remember the Lord clo closed the door in Noah's Ark, right? The Lord shut the door. That's a type of shadow rapture. Mm -hmm. Because all those that didn't get in the door, yeah. they're going to be left behind. Mm -hmm. That's a type of shadow of the rapture in this mm -hmm. world. Okay? And then also, I told him, I said, uh, it talks about five months. I said, did you know in the Noah's Ark story, I said, do you know how long the flood was? And he says, well, yeah, tell, tell me about that. I said it was 150 days. Now, most scholars know that. He said, oh yeah, I remember that now. By the way, it actually says that uh, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 24, it says the flood was 150 days. But what I told this guy was, did you know 150 days is exactly five months to the day? Because in the Jewish world, a prophetic month is 30 days, in a prophetic year is 360 days. Some of you know that. Maybe many don't. But I do want you to know five months on the Jewish calendar is exactly 150 days. So what's that got to do with the Noah's Ark story? That 150 days is a type and shadow of tribulation. Remember the people on planet, in other words, the people in the ark are above all the destruction. Like you up in heaven after the rapture when all this hell on earth is going on in the tribulation. It's the same thing. And remember he sends out the dove later after they touch down, after the ark touches, they don't get off the ark yet. The water is still abating. He sends the dove out, so actually sends the dove out three times. The third time the dove doesn't come back. Second time the dove comes out with an olive branch in his mouth and you're well familiar. But notice he also sends a raven out when he sends the dove out. That raven, which is an unclean bird, by the way, represents the Antichrist in the tribulation. And then after they get off the ark and there's the bow in the sky, it's the millennial kingdom. Why? Because the only people that rule planet Earth after the ark touches down are the righteous. And the only people that rule planet out Earth when the Lord returns with the church the righteous. Amen. Just like Noah's Ark. Amen. I wanted you to know that. Okay, so maybe uh, maybe you learned something new. And also, it, it says, uh, verse 4 through 6, they shall seek death, but not find it. Uh, did you know that death is going to take a vacation? Okay, so what's going on here? Well, let me describe it. So, what I would like to to do, uh, if you'll turn, let me go to uh, my page here. I want to share some thoughts with you. Now, as to the descriptions of the locust, the demonic locust, in Revelation chapter 9, verse 7 through 10, uh, I think, I think we, we really need to uh, read that. So let me read that. This is the description of the demons. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared in a battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of a woman, and they had teeth 
uh, were as the teeth of lions. They had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Now, again, in verse, back in verse 6, it says, In those days men shall seek death and not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now, would you agree with me that locusts do not have stingers on them? Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, some of the description here, it really does sort of sound like a locust. It does sort of look that way. I mean, if you looked at it very closely. But there's more to it than that. But these demonic locusts come up from the abyss. Remember the one that had the key? Satan didn't have the key before that, right? He opens up the bottomless pit. And uh, so now, let me say something about that. The description of the, these demons here. Uh, so I want to read, and it says, uh, there's, there's a very unusual scripture. I wanted to bring it to your attention. It might not mean much to some people, but I wanted to throw it out there. Uh, there's an unusual scripture in, in the book of Amos, chapter 7, verse 1, and it says, Thus has the Lord shown unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning, and the shooting up of the latter growth. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Now, one of the most brilliant Bible scholars, probably in the world in my personal opinion, who, who died a few years ago, he says, I have no clue what that means. And uh, I'm not sure I under understand that either, but I do want to say something, that uh, something very unusual. Uh, and that was, that man also said, however, when you read the Septuagint, the Septuagint was actually the Torah, first five books of Moses, the Hebrew, and in the third century B.C., there were seven, 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 I should say, 70 of the top Jewish scholars uh, that helped write a Greek version of the Old Testament. And that is called the Septuagint, okay? Now, the reason I'm saying that, and by the way, I do have the entire Septuagint. And uh, now, I mentioned about, I just read to you what it says in, in your King James Bible in this chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, and, and I'm not saying this particular scripture, uh, you, you know, you could take it as gospel, but I am saying it, it says something very peculiar in the Septuagint. And by the way, the Septuagint actually was the word of God that they were reading in Jesus' day of the Old Testament. Many of you probably don't know that, but, but, I, but I do want you to know that, okay? But anyway, in the Septuagint, in Amos chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Behold, a swarm of locusts are coming, and behold, the young devastating locust was Gog... G-O-G, -G, the king. Okay? Now, you're familiar with that term in the, in the Latin. Now, many scholars believe during the tribulation there's going to be a war. Uh, Israel's going to be attacked. And I'm in Ezekiel chapter 38. It talks about Gog, the land of Magog. Remember, remember that uh, in your past history. So, in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1, 2, and 3, it talks about Set thy face against Gog, G-O-G, -G, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Okay, so when you look at these terms, and by the way, there are scholars who believe Gog is actually sort of like the prince of Persia. Uh, he's an angelic fallen angel being. Okay, it, it, it's a demonic being, if you will. That may be true, maybe yes, maybe no. But I will say this. In chapter 38 of Ezekiel, where it talks about God, now, I, I've, actually, I've actually sat down with people in Moscow in 1978 and discussed this about Noah's Ark and God, the top of the mountain and, and the meanings. And I told them, I have shared with them, 
in Russia. It was one of the reasons my wife and I went to Russia for about 10 days. Brezhnev was the president of the meeting during the real Cold War back then. Uh, and I talked with them and I said, did you know the grand, I, I said, we understand that the grandsons of Noah resided in your area, what is now Russia, Meshach, Moscow. The word Moscow does come from Meshach. The word Tobolsk, the city of Tobolsk, where in May of 1960, uh, uh, Gary Powers, the UQ pilot that was shot down, he was filming over Tobolsk, city of Tobolsk in the Soviet Union. That word Tobolsk does now, how, how does that work out? And, and I was talking with the Russian, some Russian, I can't say really scholars, but I could only have access to certain people. But I told them that's one of the reasons that I wanted to go to Russia to discuss this. Uh, some of the cities in Russia are named after the grandsons of Noah in the Bible. That's a fact, okay? But I talked about God, the chief prince, too, in there. The strange thing about Ezekiel chapter 38 Usually when you get into names like Gog or Meshach, or, uh, there's, there's a track record of genealogy. We don't see any track record of genealogy with Gog, okay? We don't, we don't see that. And uh, I mean, in the King James Bible, it's strange. Uh, but I do believe, now the reason I say that, because there is going to be a gog Magog war in the tribulation, or before, some people say it could be before the tribulation, could be during the tribulation. Uh, that's talked about in Ezekiel chapter 38, 38 and 39. That's a war during the end, the end time. I mean, before the rap, could be before the rap, could be after the rap, should I say, in the seven year tribulation. I, I wanted you to know that, okay? Uh, so there's a lot of debate about some of this stuff. But anyway, I, I think that. The reason I brought this up, and I've said this for years, and it, it's my opinion, and probably a lot of scholars wouldn't agree, it also talks about a war with the, the war of Gog and Magog uh, later, after the thousand years, when the thousand year millennial kingdom is over with. Did you know that? I do believe it's talking about Gog. Now, we know Satan's going to be released for a short period of time after the thousand year millennial kingdom's over with. He's in hell during that thousand years, okay? He's, he's bound in hell during that thousand years. Him and the Antichrist and the false prophet, all three of them, they're there in hell. But, they're, but, but, but Satan is released for a short time and evidently uh, he, he brings temptation to the world just before, in a very short time, he's dealt with and God takes him out and he's put in the lake of fire forever and forever. Uh, but I think that other war of God, may God, is at the end of the thousand years. That's my personal opinion, but I want to at least share that with you. Okay, so anyway, uh, I thought it was kind of important to share that with you. Uh, so this is my last page. The Sixth Trumpet, uh, chapter 9, verse 13 through 21. And I'm going to go ahead and read this very quickly. In the sixth angel, sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, say to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are found in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed and were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army horsemen were 200,000 thousand. That's 200 million to you. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and then the sat on them, in other words, they had riders on them, having breastplates of fire and jacinth and brimstone and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by fire, and by the smoke and by the brimstone was issued out of their mouths. For their power was in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads with them, 
uh, they do hurt. Okay, so these are demonic beings. Now, many of you have probably heard that there are some prophetic ministries in the past, and I don't agree with this, and they say these 200 million are the kings of the east from China. These are Chinese troops during the tribulation. They're going to march against Israel when the Euphrates River dries up and da 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 I mean, that's, that's, that's their opinion about it. Personally, I don't agree with any of that. These are demonic beings that come up out of the abyss. Man. Okay, that is, and, and I will say this, there's a long list of, of great Bible scholars that agree with what I just told you. These are demonic beings. Okay, they're really, really, really nasty. And uh, so these are the ones that are going to deal with men. And again, they can't touch the 144,000. Okay, so, uh, so verse 16 in particular, uh, again, it's 200 million. Is it quite possible? Now, since there's 200 million, does it mean that uh, uh, one-fourth of the earth, there's 50 million, and then the other fourth of the earth, there's another 50 million, and then 50 million and 50 million for a total of 200 million. You know, I don't know. Uh, but I do know there's going to be pure torment. And if you think for a moment the Lord is going to allow, allow you to go through that, or your children, okay, that are saved, the answer is no. There are people, and there's a lot of ministries that are teaching we're going to go through the tribulation, the church. That is not true. We're supposed to comfort one another with these words. the blessed hope. Okay? Amen. There's a whole lot of scriptures that, that, that point that out. But I wanted to share them. Okay, now, the four angels bound in the Euphrates, uh, let's say verse 14 and 15. I want to I wanna go back to that. Uh, saying to the angel, six angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great River Euphrates and the four angels were loose. These are demonic beings that are bound in the abyss. They have been there for thousands of years. They're prepared for an hour, a day, and a month, and a year to slay the third part of men. Okay, now they don't, they, these, these four evil angels, they don't, give, they don't give us their names. I do believe we have the name of one who has control over them. Okay, so, uh, so let's, uh, I want you to go to a chart, one of the charts that I provided you. I want you to look at this. Tribulation carnage. Does everybody have that? Yes. Uh, page number four. How many people are going to die in the tribulation? Here. The fourth seal, one fourth of the earth are going to die. That's 25 percent. Would you agree with me? It says that in Revelation chapter six, verse seven and eight. Okay. In chapter six, in the trump, of course, that was a the fourth seal, if you will. The sixth trumpet judgment. Uh, it's 33 percent. In other words. Let me put it in perspective. A fourth of the people are going to die, and what's left over later, a third of them are going to die. That's 25% and 33%. That's 58% of all the people that are left alive on planet Earth are going to die in the tribulation. I didn't make this up. That's God's word. This is what the unsaved people that we don't reach are going to go through. Wow. Okay? Is God giving us an advantage yes, to you. share the good news with people Amen. before it's too late. Yes. That's what that page is all about. I'm not trying to scare people to death. I'm trying to scare people to life. Amen. 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 Uh, now, I want to say something about the, uh, you're going to find this very fascinating. I'm on the home stretch now, by the way. Uh, so let's talk about some ancient history concerning the Euphrates River. I'm going down through the history of the past, kind of bringing you up to date with things that have, that have been happening since ancient times. To start with, this was the eastern boundary of the land that God gave Israel in, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. 
Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 7, Joshua chapter 1, verse 4, and 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 21 and 24. It says that. Euphrates. You're going to see that word, Euphrates, River, several times, especially in, in the book of Revelation here. Euphrates was the generic boundary separating the east from the west. In other words, in human in historic way of thinking back then, uh, the line between east and west was the Euphrates River. Now, I'm going to share some history with you. The Roman Empire, even at its peak, this is 2,000 years ago when Jesus was living, the Roman Empire feared the Parthian Empire on the other side of that Euphrates River. Uh, you could call it what was left of the Iranian Empire. Uh, the uh, the Asakid, uh, uh, I guess to pronounce it, it's I-S-A-C-I-D, uh, Asakid, that was the Asakid Empire. That was the technical name of that land on the other side of, of the Euphrates. Now, uh, why am I sharing all that information with you? You could say the demonic prince of Persia was still around back then in Jesus' day, and he still is there today as he was in the book of Daniel. And if you don't believe that, just look what's going on with Iran today. By the way, the Magi came from the Parthian Empire. That's why King Herod feared them too. Did you know? Did you know the Romans feared the Parthian Empire? They were scared of them. That's probably why King Herod, when, when the Magi came, Jesus being born, if you will, uh, he didn't mess with them. They were very, very powerful people. And, and, and there's a lot of history behind them. And I, I'm sharing, uh, in, I think, information from a historical perspective. I think that's important for you to know. The reference to this river actually dates back to Eden 6,000 years ago. Where was the Garden of Eden? Obviously, it was east of Eden. But where was Eden? Obviously, it was west of the Garden. And what's west of the Euphrates? Israel. That's where Eden was. Whose name is embedded on the geography of Jerusalem? in Hebrew letters, the geography of Jerusalem, you can see, remember God said 33 times in his word, I will put my name on that place. Amen. And he did. Hallelujah. You can see the letters yud Hey vav Hey in the geography of the land, the topography of Jerusalem. Remember, remember we have uh, uh, those three valleys there, the Tyrophian Valley, Valley of Hinnom, and uh, what's that other one to the east there, uh, Brother Smith uh, of Jerusalem? Kidron Valley. Kidron Valley, yeah. Those three valleys make up the letter Shin, S-H-I-N. That number or that letter represents the Lord God Almighty. Did you know that? That's right. When God said, I will put my name on that place. It's literally in the journey. I've been sharing that over 45 years. I know years ago, a lot of people thought I was a little off my rocker. Of course, as the last 10, 20 years or so, people are, are learning more and more about that. But, but anyway, I thought that was important to share. Uh, so, God said he would put his name on that place. The lesson to all the governments of planet Earth is don't touch the apple of God's eye. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, last but not least, uh, I'm going to wrap it up now and talk about that last chart that you have. Actually, the last two charts. Uh, I am in verse 20 and 21. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands. And they should not worship devils, idols of gold, 
and silver and brass and stone and of wood, neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Now, this page, page number five, everybody got that hand out? Now, this is, not a, this is not a direct quote from the Bible, but it's kind of a paraphrase in the Bible. Trumpet 6 releases six, but four demons allowed by God to lead the demonic army that numbers 200 million horsemen that destroy, that, that destroys one-third of all the remaining humans on planet Earth. This event is not to be confused with the later human army launched in trumpet number 7 that is led by demons in Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, heading to destroy Jerusalem and fight God and Armageddon. Uh, Revelation uh, 9, 12 through 19, uh, one woe is past. Behold, two more woes are coming after these. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year were released to kill the third part of mankind. Now the number of the num number of the army of horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. Thus I saw horses in the vision. Those that sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, uh, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow, and heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By the way, that smoke's going on all over the world. Remember I told you the oxygen is being depleted because a lot of the trees are dead. And a lot of the ocean has blood in it. Okay? By these three plagues, the third part of mankind was killed. And by the fire and smoke and the brimstone came out of their mouths, for their power was in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. And of course, uh, regular, uh, regular locusts uh, do not have that capability, obviously. Okay, so here's my last parting shot here. That last page, see that despite all the horrors, it starts with that, everybody got that, that's page number six. Despite all the horrors, uh, people still are chained by the sin of rebellion that only Christ could release them from. Now, chapter nine, verse 20, 21, but the rest of mankind now I want you to listen to what I'm going to say because I'm going to, I'm going to share some thoughts about what this is talking about. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, and brass, and stone, and wood, which can neither see, nor, nor hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders and their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Uh, now, let's talk about, it says, did not repent. I want to talk about did not repent of murder. There's going to be a lot of murdering going on during this time of the tribulation. A lot of people are going to be killing other people for food or, or whatever. It's total calamity on planet Earth. It won't even be safe for children to go to school for reasons that we talked about. The other thing is, it, then it says, of their sorceries. Uh, that Greek word is pharmakia. Right. The use of drugs for all purposes, in other words, not, not from the medical community for legitimate reasons. Let me say this. When I was young, I'm over 73 years old. When I was young, the FDA, the Federal uh, FDA Food and Drug Administration, yes, thank you, they were there to protect the folks. They're not, prote they're not protecting the folks anymore. Okay, you know that, and I know that. This administration in Washington, they're not protecting the folks. You know and I know, many of the states now allow marijuana to be used. And they're trying to allow other illicit drugs, even more powerful than that, to be legalized. And there are some places in the country where that is allowed in some of the cities, especially large cities in California, and I could name some other states. During the tribulation, there is going to be drugs available to all kinds of people. Okay? 
mean, you go back 50, 60 years ago, it wasn't like that in the States. Bad things are happening with fentanyl. I mean, you know what's going on with fentanyl. Amen. More people between the ages of, I believe it's 8 and 25 or 8 or 50, they're dying more of that than any other thing uh, out there in our society today. So sorcery is going to play a major play in the tribulation. And then, it talk, and then it's alluding to sexual immor immorality. Well, just look at what's going on. I don't have to make a comment about that. Uh, but the laws are changing, and they're right. not for the good, Amen. and they're not for the parents. Amen. And then it says it's, it's alluding to their thefts. And again, all of that, they did not repent. Okay, so what's this all about? It's all about God is trying to tell the inhabitants of the, the world, you still have time. Yes. Get ready. Now we got we need to get ready too. Amen. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would not let the night go by Amen. without letting Christ in my life and asking him to forgive me of my sins. And I believe all of us have a responsibility to reach our loved ones. I'm talking about our sons and our daughters and our grandchildren. Hallelujah. And then others. And we need to take a stand at work. Okay, we need to take a stand at society, and we need to say and do the right thing, regardless of what they may think, even in the workplace, even at school. And, and I can say, I've been here, I don't know, 13, 15 years, something like that. Uh, I'm grateful to the ministry of our pastor, because everything that I just told you, I know he feels, him and his wife feel the same way. Not, not all churches are like that, friend. Trust me, they're not. A lot of them a lot of churches will not even talk about the book of Revelation. So with that, uh, I hope that you were blessed, uh, and uh, I will turn the service over to you first. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Fact number one. If 50 people die in India, that's not news. Hundreds of people are dying in India because of poisons, alcohol. Alcohol laced with methanol. Oh my goodness. No news? You didn't no. hear that? No. no. Amen. Fact number two. Methanol. Okay. Fact number two. Mecca is the uh, the only city for the Muslim. Mm -hmm. This time of the year, they march to Mecca. Mm -hmm. More than 1,300 die and eat stroke up to today already. Mm. Recently? Yes. Recently. Yes. 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 In the last week or so. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Five people died. That's not news. 1,300 died. News. We start, we start with what we believe in. Amen. That God's word is true. Amen. And we are going to help people to understand the best we can that it is true. Yes. And they need to prepare because He is coming soon. Amen. And when the church leaves, woe be unto those who are left. Oh, amen. Can you stand to your feet? Our God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for the anointing that you've given us, O oh Master, as we teach your word. Oh God, thank you for the receptive heart that you've placed before us. Here in the church and those who are listening online. Oh God, we ask, dear Lord, that you let whatever was taught go deep and wide. Give us courage, O oh Master. Let your Holy Spirit strengthen us to help those who are not saved yet. Let your word go deep and wide in this world, O oh God, we pray through this ministry. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.